So once again, we are starting off on Google Classroom, and we are still in the years 1450 to 1750. And we've already looked at these years with political lenses. We just got done looking at these years with economic lenses. Now we're going to switch gears into looking at these years with religious and cultural lenses. Same year, different perspective. And for those who are absent, unfortunately, I think you missed a very cool class, but you will see here. It is the opening of chapter 7, and there are two rectangles, a Google Form and the PowerPoint that I uh, used in class. Now, in terms of the form, even if you are absent, I would still like you to participate with this form. And if you click on it, you will see three questions. Question 1, how religious do you consider yourself? All the way from not religious at all to highly religious. And I'm curious of the makeup of this class. Is it a religious class, non-religious class, somewhere in between? Now, this question is really at the crux of this chapter and a very bread and butter philosophical question. Is faith and science compatible? Can one take a faith-based worldview and reconcile it with a scientific worldview? And I'm, not, I'm not presenting any answers here. I'm posing this to you. So we will see as a class. Do you think it can be reconciled? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. And then the final question is which religious affiliation do you self identify with Roman Catholic, Orthodox Christian, Protestant Christian, Islamic, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, nun, agnostic, atheist, other. Now, whatever you are, A, we live in America, which is very cool. You can choose whatever you want to do, but I will pose the question, how did you get there? What, you know, was it your ancestors? Was it the way you were raised? Is it geography? Is it a personal epiphany? I don't know. So I know you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion. Okay, that's what I do for a living. I find them interesting. So that's what we're doing. So after we got done with our discussion, we got into more of the uh, meat and potatoes of the unit with this opening. And I've already opened it. Okay, so this is what we learned about in class. And in on page 293, or pardon me, 294, it says the globalization of Christianity. So here's the story in a nutshell. So we talked about the survey results, okay, in class. And if you were absent, we can keep talking about it when you return, okay? So I posed a question to the class. What do you know about the history of Christianity? Some people knew a ton, some knew nothing. But again, I wanted to see your prior knowledge of Christianity because with the globalization of Christianity, religion aside, this is not a religious principle, this isn't Sunday school, it was a world changer historically, okay? So in a nutshell, the early roots of Christianity, Christianity was a brand new religion about 2,000 years ago in Judea, which is in modern day Israel. I've been there actually, it's a very cool place. Hope you get to see it. And many different religions existed in the Roman Empire at the time, Christianity being one of them in a distant part of the empire. And at first it was small and Roman leadership didn't really notice it. And you can't talk about Christianity, obviously, without talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He was born in 4 BC in Bethlehem. He worshiped God, followed Jewish law. And at 30, he began to preach to villagers. And he used parables, which are short, simple stories with a moral lesson. He didn't lecture like I'm doing. He told stories, these parables, and they were very, very effective. He had 12 disciples that helped him spread his ideas. And some Jews in Jerusalem welcomed Jesus. Many of the priests, however, felt threatened by him. And Roman authorities felt Jesus would lead the Jews in a revolt against their rule. So anyway, he, he was put to death and he was uh, killed by crucifixion. To this day, the Christian symbol is the cross. Now, for Christians, they believe on the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. So the death of Jesus, they signify by Good Friday, and his ascension is Easter Sunday, the highest holiday to a Christian. Now, at this point, Jesus is dead, but Christianity spreads primarily through this man named Paul or St. Paul, if you're Christian. Now, he traveled about and wrote letters, and he, these letters make up um, part of the New Testament. In fact, if you are a churchgoer, it would be familiar to you saying, uh, today's lesson is from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. This is Paul's letter to the Romans. So Paul was chiefly responsible in spreading Christianity. But again, it's still early. It's, it's fledgling stages of Christianity. And Christians were oppressed. Uh, Romans were not tolerant uh, towards Christians because they refused to honor the emperor with sacrifices. They refused to worship Roman gods. 
And Christians were used as scapegoats. If Rome was having a problem, blame the Christians. Throw them into the Colosseum and let gladiators and lions rip them apart and people felt better. So Christianity at this point is small and oppressed. You know, far away from being a dominant force in history that it became. Now this is the turning point. Emperor Constantine, okay, the most powerful man in the world, issued, or one of the most powerful men in the world, I should say, issued the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. And this edict granted freedom of worship to all citizens. In other words, Romans stopped being oppressed. And the most powerful man on the in the world, or at least one of them, uh, not only condoned Christianity or let it happen, he encouraged Christianity. And this was a game changer. Then we see Christianity growing at a very rapid rate. Now, at 10, in 1054, the church splits in two. It's called the Great Schism. So there was debate in terms of you know, idols, in terms of methods of worship, in terms of um, dogma. And this fight resulted in a split with the western part of Europe becoming or remaining Roman Catholic and the eastern part becoming Orthodox, which went into Russia and Eastern Europe. Now, this schism has not been healed to this day. Okay. Now, if you look at Christianity, essentially there are four major denominations, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Protestant, and then the subsets in between. So each of these subsets have a story and a historical antecedent. Now, I'm not going to do justice. You know, this is a whole class in and of itself. But as you can see, Christianity as one word has a lot of different denominations and sects. Now, in uh, 517, this is a major game changer, Martin Luther who was very upset with some of the churches, the Catholic church's practices as a monk, wrote 95 things that he was troubled by, and he nailed it to the church's door. And in particular, he was upset with selling indulgences and simony, which you could, if you were rich, you could absolve of your sins and get into heaven, which he felt, this is wrong. And for people who you know, agreed with him, they were ready to break away from the Catholic Church. Now, a lot of people think Martin Luther was the first. He was probably, I wouldn't say he's the first, but he's the one that really took it to fruition. Because before Martin Luther, we had Wycliffe, who questioned the authority of the Pope. Roman Catholics think the Pope is infallible, meaning he can do no wrong. Wycliffe said, I don't know about all that, which was very bold at the time. Jan Hus uh, criticized the vast wealth of the Church, saying, hey, Christians, we shouldn't be spending all our money on fancy clothes and food and should give it to the needy. Uh, Erasmus attacked the corruption of the church, but it was Martin Luther who really took these thoughts into fruition and started the Reformation, reform, Protestant Reformation. Okay, protest, reform, Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther said the Bible is the only source of truth. Salvation comes only through faith in Christ. And people can understand the Bible themselves. Now, his ideas were spread by the printing press. And for those who agreed with it, they became Protestants. For those who disagreed with it, they remained Catholic. Now, why is this so important on a non-religious level? Because Martin Luther said this. Protestants said this. You have to read the Bible. Now, some people at the time, a lot of people at the time said, I can't read. Okay. Time to learn how to read. And if you're going to read a Bible, you can read everything else. This increased literacy. This is the historical game changer. Okay. Now, like I said, not everybody, you know, took Martin Luther's words and said, yeah, I'm going to break away from um, the home church. No. In fact, some Catholics were quite upset about this, and people in power were upset by this. And what happened was this counter Reformation where Catholic on uh, Protestant vi uh, violence was very pronounced. St. Ba Bartholomew's Day Massacre, you can see the painting and people getting thrown out windows and clubbed over the head and, and that kind of stuff. So it's a very violent thing. Now, the Reformation then spread to other countries. Okay, bear in mind, Martin Luther was a German, but it spread to France, it spread to Switzerland. Um, in England, King Henry VIII started his own branch of Christianity called the Anglicans in order for him to divorce. So this um, tension culminated in the Thirty Years' War, which was a religious conflict fought primarily in Central Europe. It is one of the longest, most brutal wars in human history, with eight million casualties resulting from military battles, as well as the famine and disease caused from the conflict. Thirty years, 1618, 1648, and it was a battle between Catholic and Protestant states that formed the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, 
And then it eventually became less about religion and more about politics. But unfortunately, uh, there's been tension between Christians and, and the history. And like I said, the council or the counter reformation stemming from the Council of Trent's decision to reaffirm the uniqueness, uniqueness of Catholicism. It's the only form of Christianity. So it was tense. OK, religion can um, it's, a, it's a very paradoxical concept. It can probably unite people better than anything, but it can divide people better than anything. Maybe not better, worse than anything. So it's very paradoxical in that respect. So anyway. This video, I know I gave you a drink with a fire hose and not a garden hose, but it does correspond with the reading in your book on page 293, and hopefully you found it interesting. I know talking about religion, I always find it interesting. So anyhow, thanks for watching.